chapter 2 and verse 37 and 38. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When Ronald Reagan was a little boy he was staying with his auntie and she took him to the cobblers to get a new pair of shoes made up and the cobbler asked asked him do you want round shoes or rounded caps on the toes rounded toes or do you want square toes and and reagan didn't know what to what to decide and he was umming and ahhing and he couldn't make a decision the cobbler said well don't worry about it just pop back in sometime in the next week and let me know what you want well reagan didn't pop back in and just over a week later the cobbler saw him in the street and said Mr. Reagan, uh, what, what kind of toes do you want? Do you want rounded toes on your shoes or do you want square ones? And still Reagan couldn't decide and he said, well, don't worry about it, just come and see me next week and your shoes will be ready. And so Reagan went in to get his shoes and he found that one of them had round toes and the other one had square toes. And Reagan says that I learned right then and there, if you don't make your own decisions, someone else will make them for you. If you don't like making your own decisions, you're really not going to like verse 38. And perhaps you've come to church this evening thinking it's been a nice day on the whole, a bit rainy, but we've had a good lunch and we'll go and do the right thing and we'll come out to church this evening and then we'll get through the service and have some supper and an early night. This passage interrupts all of that. In this text, God calls every one of us to make the most important, weighty decision you could ever make and you will have made it before you leave that door. All of us are on the spot with a choice to make because the big thing that we're going to see tonight is that real preaching calls for a decision. In university, I took a paper called Barbarian Europe and it was about the tribes that eventually would overrun the Roman Empire and I thought that sounded really cool and I went along to the first lecture full of enthusiasm and sat there for 60 minutes while the lecturer spoke to us all about cauldrons, ancient cooking pots. And he was enthusiastic. He loved the subject. He was talking all about how they were important status symbols for the different tribes. They were cooking pots. Uh, and no matter how well you sell it, that's, that's all they were. By the end, I was glad it was over. I wasn't sure how many more lectures I'd come to in that part of the course. We'd heard lots about cooking pots. Some of us had learned lots. But but it didn't impact our lives. We didn't have to change. We didn't have to do anything in light of what we'd heard. Now, so much of what gets called preaching today is exactly the same. And you're expected to come and listen and learn and then just go back to your normal life. And if there's any hint whatsoever in that preaching that things need to change, it's very much take it or leave it. It's up to you. Here's some suggestions. Here's what you could do in light of this passage. But it's up to you whether you do anything about it. Change if you want to. My God does not speak like that. God is not one of those recommended speed signs on the corner that all of you ignored on the way here this evening. God is the cop car in the rear view. God is not the, the servant at the party holding out a tray of snacks for you to take one if you fancy. He's the king who calls the party, who speaks, and the whole world must obey or suffer the consequences. When God speaks, we're not going to hear suggestions for how we can improve our life, but commands to keep. Now, I left that first lecture feeling like I'd just wasted an hour of my life. Because I knew if I'd forgotten every single word that I'd just heard, it would have exactly the same impact on me as if I remembered every one. Real preaching is not like that. Real preaching demands that things change. It calls for a decision, and we see that here in verse 38. Peter said to them, they're asking this question, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the people hear Peter's preaching, and they're cut to the heart, and they recognize that something needs to change. After what they've just heard about Jesus, their life can't go on the same way that it was before. They have to do something, but they don't know what it is they've got to do. 
And so they ask Peter in verse 37, Brothers, what shall we do? And then Peter's answer comes. There are three things. Three things that need to happen in light of the preaching of the gospel. Number one, there is action to be taken. These are going to be my three points tonight. Number one is there is action to be taken. And so Peter calls to, talks to the crowd. He tells them that they've got to repent. That's the first thing. Now you know that that word means a 180 degree turn in the way that you're living. It means a complete turnaround in your life. A total change so that the compass of your heart is no longer oriented towards me, but towards God. What He wants, not what I want. Repenting means dragging you off the throne of your heart, lifting the crown off your head and laying at the feet of Jesus. It's a, a heartfelt recognition, realization and confession that if I go on living my way, I'm going to spend eternity in hell. Living with me in charge is only going to guarantee my eternal death. So I can't live for myself anymore. I'm turning my back on myself and my sin. But there's another side to the coin when it comes to the action that needs to be taken. And Peter tells the crowd that they also must be baptized. And so Peter's saying there, it's not enough just to turn away from you. You've got to turn to Jesus. He's telling the crowd, be baptized. And when a believer is baptized, they're making this public commitment to follow and associate themselves with Jesus. Now, there were a couple of people here this morning, and Phil's here this evening, who are due to be baptized soon. And when you go under that water, it's going to symbolize, represent the death of the old Phil. I'm going to pick on Phil because he's the only one here tonight who's due to be baptized. But it will represent the death of the old Phil. The death of Phil's time as the ruler of Phil's life. And as he comes out of the water, it will symbolize the resurrection of Phil's new life in the Lord Jesus. That it's no longer Phil who lives, but Christ who lives in him. Uh, and so Peter's first answer to the crowd is that you must repent. You must turn. In light of the hearing of the gospel, after it's been preached, you must turn from yourself to Christ. You must tell him you're sorry for all the wrong that you've done and all the wrong that you are. And for the years that you've spent living for you, thinking nothing of Jesus, even though he loves you so much that he, he died to rescue you from sin and hell. Now you must tell him, I want to live for you now. I want to go your way. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. That's what Peter's saying when he's saying, repent and be baptized. There's something to do. Secondly, there's a truth to be believed. Remember, Peter is preaching to the Jews in Jerusalem and he has demonstrated to them very clearly from those passages of scripture that he quotes and we can see on our page is slightly indented in the text he's demonstrated to them very clearly that Jesus is the Messiah he's the one who was sent by God that the nation has been looking forward to and as soon as they realize that they know there is nobody else for them to put their faith in but we don't live in a world like that we live in a world where there are lots and lots of people telling us that their way is right some people telling us to, to follow me, live the way I live. In an age of pluralism, and that's, that's what our culture's like, where it's wrong to say that other ways are wrong, where it's bigoted to say that Jesus is the only way, why would anybody put their trust in Jesus? Why, why would we be so narrow-minded as to rely on Jesus and Jesus alone? Well, the answer to that is in what Peter tells the crowd they must believe. See, when they're baptized, when they put their trust in the Lord Jesus and commit to following him, they should do it because he is the one person in all the world who offers what all the world needs more than anything else. Verse 38. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why should I, Peter? Why should I be so narrow-minded and, and hitch my wagon to Jesus why should I nail Jesus colors to my mast in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins sin is that big broad blanket term for all of our rebellion against God sin is your heavenly criminal 
record. Every time we break God's law, that's a sin. Every time we fail to keep God's law, that's a sin. Every moment of every day that we fail to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength is a sin. Every moment we fail to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves is a sin. And on top of that, every dirty thought, every selfish emotion, every gossiped word is a sin. In the American state of Maine in 2013, a man named Michael Brewer was arrested for burglary. He had a 45-page criminal record. And you think, on the criminal record, that's only the stuff they've caught you for. 45 pages. And yet, and yet if we're real with ourselves, and we remember that God sees everything, that God knows the thoughts in our minds, and, and the desires of our hearts, my criminal record would make 45 pages look like an introduction. In university, I spent a lot of time studying in, in what was called the National Library of Wales. It's a copyright library. And so that means as soon as a book is published in the UK, a copy legally has to be sent to that library. And so this building is massive. And it's got vaults underground, books upon books upon shelves upon shelves with these great big walls that move when you turn the handle, these huge stacks of books. Now imagine you were on one of the tours of the library or I was on one of the tours of this library and they open up the stacks and I'm looking along the spines and I take one of the books off the shelf and look at the spine and it says The Sins of Jeff Lloyd Volume 1, 134,676 and, and, and it begins to sink in that every single book not just every sin in millions but every book of sin out of the millions is my record. Maybe then we're starting to get close. In 1989, a, a Thai con artist was imprisoned for fraud. And they were sentenced to 141,078 years in prison. You say, why was the sentence so huge? And the answer is because some of the people they conned were in the royal family. Who we sin against has a big impact on the seriousness of the crime and the punishment that it deserves. And now here's me. And, and I think I'm quite a good guy. I grew up in a, a lovely home. Was taught well as a kid. But I know a little bit of what my heart's like. I know how many millions upon millions of sins I've managed to commit in only 34 years. Some of you guys have built extensions and extensions on the library. But it's there. Years and years. And every single one of those sins, in every single one of those books, on every one of those shelves, in every one of those stacks, is committed against the, the most important, most beautiful, most worthy, most holy God who every single day of my 34 years has continued to give me breath in my lungs, food on my table, a roof over my head. And all of these sins are against him. He's the one who keeps the planet spinning moment by moment. And all of my sins are against him. When the lead singer of the, the rock band, The Lost Prophets, was arrested in South Wales, the local police servers didn't have enough digital storage space to hold all of the child pornography that he had on his computer at home. They had to upgrade their servers to hold it all. But God's infinite, unscalable memory has all of my sins. Big sins, small sins, pretty sins, ugly sins. All of the sins that we boast in, all of the sins that we shiver at, and hope that nobody else will ever know what we're really like. Every single one of them, God's got them. And he's got them logged away. And he knows. And so there's not a single one of us, is there? Who's getting into heaven? God will not reward the wicked. He'll give every single one of us what we deserve. Death and hell. 
This is why the Lord Jesus is so precious. This is why every single one of you should have no bigger priority in your life than making sure you belong to Jesus. That you've repented of your sin and put your faith in Christ. For Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world. But that the world would be saved through him. Saved. How can Jesus save you from your sins? How can he help us escape the punishment we deserve? He does it by taking the punishment for us. On the cross, God transferred all of my horrific, heavenly criminal record onto Jesus. It's like God went into the database of heaven and, and, and bought up my record. And right at the top where it says Jeff Lloyd, he, he deletes it. And instead he types in the name Jesus and makes Jesus responsible for every single one of my sins. As Jesus climbs that hill, Golgotha, to be crucified, it's like he climbs up the outside of the library of the sins of Jeff Lloyd and rips down that name and nails up his own. Jesus, he takes responsibility for all my sin and then God unleashes against his son all of the judgment and all of the punishment that all of my sins deserve. He crushes Jesus. He puts Jesus through hell, the hell that I deserve, on the cross. And my sins are paid for. And I can be forgiven. And so the scriptures say, in him we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. God can look at all my gross sins and forgive them because they've been paid for in Christ. But, and, and here's the over, over abundant, the super abundant grace of God. He's not finished there. Because the third thing that Peter tells them is that there's grace to be received. Not only can God forgive, but there's more. God's work in heaven's criminal record office is not finished when he changes your name to Jesus and punishes Jesus for your sins. He also goes into Jesus' record. Jesus' spotless, perfect record. His, his 33 years of of entirely obeying God's law and then right at the top he types in your name and then he saves it and closes it and it's never going to be opened again so it can't be added to it can't be ruined with new sins it can't be taken away from until the day of judgment when God will, will bring up that record as you appear before him and he'll call out Joseph Tarbotten and the, and the record will be brought up and what will be there? Jesus perfect record and it will be flawless and he'll look at Joseph and he'll look at every single one of you who belongs to the Lord Jesus through Jesus Christ your righteousness will be there right before him and he will welcome you into all of Jesus has earned all of Jesus success his right to heaven his rewards now how do we know that God will do that for us? How do we know today that, that God is going to look at us that way when we come before him in judgment because we don't want to wait until that moment to find out if we are in Christ? How do we know if God counts us as in Jesus? And the answer to that is what Peter says next. It's ultimately that Jesus is in you. How do I know that I am in Jesus? Is Jesus in you? Now the only way that a holy God could ever live in us, with us, is if we've been made clean. If we've been washed entirely so that there's not a single sniff of sin about us anymore. See, God hates sin. He cannot be anywhere near it. The proof of that is the cross. Because even when the son that he's loved more than anything from before time becomes our sin-bearing substitute, God can't stand it to the point that he must crush Jesus. God could never live with a sinner. He cannot live with me and you unless we're clean. But you look at what Peter says. You repent. You be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You put your faith, your trust in the Lord Jesus. And you will receive, he says, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, you do this. You turn from your sin. You turn to Christ. You confess to God, I am a sinner. And I need you to save me. You put your trust in the Lord Jesus, in his death, his resurrection, and that alone, God will come to you and he will live with you and prove then that you're safe in the Lord Jesus. The assurance that there's nothing to fear from death and judgment will be there. You'll have his spirit living with you. And he'll 
assure you day by day, there's nothing waiting for you to fear in death, in hell. For your eternity is secure with Christ forever. Now, I've picked on Phil. Josh, I'm going to pick on you and everybody else who has a responsibility to preach. Anybody who's asked to preach, screw this into your head and into your heart. If all you ever do is lay out the facts of the gospel, you've not preached. And, and if you teach the Bible in, in such a compelling way that everybody goes out and they've understood every single word that you've said and they've learned heaps and they're saying, wow, that's really expanded my horizons. I didn't know that before. But that's all you've done. You've not preached. Uh, and if you've told people about Jesus and they go away thinking that Jesus is more wonderful than I ever knew before and that's all you've done. Joseph's here as well. I can pick on you and there are other men who should be picked on too. You've not preached if that's all you've done. The gospel truth that we declare demands a change. And so you must preach for change. When God speaks, there are things to do and to believe and to receive. Now that being the case, if you're a Christian, you scan your eyes over the last five years. And ask yourself this question. Have I been changing? Think back a few years. There was a time where I, you know, I felt I was going strong. and I was encouraged and I was hungry to be at church and, and at the midweek. But it's just not there anymore. Am I still changing? Are you brave enough to ask yourself that question? Am I changing? If you're really brave, ask your wife. Ask your spouse. Ask your husband. Honey, do you... Do you see me changing? And you see evidence in my life that I'm becoming more like the Lord Jesus. And if not, then here's the challenge of God's word to you this evening. Oh, repent. Come back to God. Turn away from, from however you've been living that hasn't been resulting in change and come back to Him. Pray, Lord, if there is some sin in my life, if there's something getting in the way, if I've been prioritizing something else, if there's some attitude or some belief or some behavior that has become a, a hurdle or a stumbling block in my route to pursuing Jesus, if there's some bitterness, some unforgiveness, some addiction that, that's got in the way and stopped me from loving the Lord Jesus as I should, or oh, help me to see what it is, help me to tear it out of the way so that I might walk with Christ again. I want to live for you. You must repent. And then you must believe. Oh, believe that you're forgiven. If Christ could forgive you the first time with all of your sin and all your rottenness and all your failure when you came to the cross and clung to it and said, Jesus, save a sinner like me. He can forgive you now. You're his much loved child. He's been so faithful to you for all the years that you've walked with him no matter how poorly you've walked. Good shepherd has rescued you again and again out of all the places you've fallen into and all the sticky situations you've gotten yourself into, he's not going to give up on you now. He's not going to say no to your repentance now. You believe that he forgives. You lean on the cross again and then you receive the Holy Spirit. You commit yourself to going God's way, not grieving him anymore, but pleasing him. You come to church next Sunday with a, a new attitude. It says, I'm not coming to listen but I'm coming to change because I believe that God is speaking. And when God speaks, His Word demands that I change. Now, what if you're not a Christian? Well, this evening you've heard you're a sinner and, and that by God's standard, there's no hope of getting into heaven. And deep down, you've always known this. But today you've heard it straight. You know, like the, the fellow who feels there's something wrong in his body, but it's not until the doctor tells him it's cancer that things become real. And things have to change for him. And they have to change for you now that God is giving you this diagnosis of sin. But that's not all God has given you. And if that doctor says, yes, it's cancer, it's killing you, but a simple operation will get rid of it. That man doesn't have to leave miserable. There's hope. And if you've been listening, you've already heard there's hope for you too. The gospel promises hope, but you've got to do something. You've got to repent. You've got to turn from yourself and put your trust in Jesus. You've got to believe something. 
that when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, it was your sin that he was paying for. It was your death that he was dying. And because of his death, all of your sins, the, the total sum, every single one is forgiven. And you've got to believe that. Anything less is going to rob you of joy that should be rightly yours as a Christian. There are lots of Christians who go through life as a follower of Jesus, never experiencing the depth of joy that they should because they've done things in their past and they think there's no way Jesus could really forgive that. They, they think, they, I, I've still got to make up for that a little bit myself. Jesus has done so much, but I've got, to, I've got to do this or that to make up for it a little bit myself. And when we do that, we reduce everything that Jesus accomplished on the cross. We're saying, Jesus did all that and it's great, but he needs me a little bit too. That's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus has paid it all. The gospel is what we sung earlier and Mark prayed about, my sin or the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to his cross and I bear it no more praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my soul you can have the same joy that Horatio Spafford had as he wrote those words all your sin forgiven by God and then you've got to receive something God would come and live with you today he would adopt you into his family come and live in your heart he would do that for you. So what are you going to do? You've got a choice to make. And you will have made your choice by the time you leave that door. When you go home, who's going to be king of your life? Will it be you? Will it be Jesus? You keep following yourself to hell? Or turn from yourself. Throw yourself on the mercy of the Lord Jesus. Follow him into life everlasting. Let's pray. Father, never let a wonderful truth that you've given us to preach in the gospel become familiar or old. Father, we pray that whenever we hear it preached, we'd be refreshed by it and we'd be encouraged by it and we'd leave church, those of us who already belong to you, with glad hearts because all of our sin has been taken care of. Oh, there are so many things that we've done and said and thought and felt that we would be utterly devastated if our friends and neighbours knew. And yet you know them. And your opinion is, is so much more important. Heaven and hell hang on your opinion of us. You know what we're really like. You know us better than ourselves. Better than we know ourselves. And yet still you reach out to us in love. And you call out to us in grace and you say... Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Simple as that. It's wonderful as that. Turn from yourself and this road that leads to hell. Turn to Jesus. Follow the good shepherd home to heaven. Father, we know that that costs. We know that turning back on self means the death of self. It's the easiest thing and yet the hardest thing to do. Oh, help us to see then. Give us spiritual eyes to see the folly of not putting our trust in the Lord Jesus, of relying on anyone or anything other than Him. Help us to see Him as all wonderful, all precious. Don't let a single one of us leave here tonight without going home with you, living in our hearts. We pray it for your glory in your name. Amen.